as I told you, we confirm by a second method. If it confirms, and in most cases it does, um, we start asking ourselves questions. Has this mutation been published before in association with the phenotype that was seen in the patient? And is that data that was published any good? And if it is, you have a positive result, and we will sign out a positive report to you. What if what we find is not published? And this happens more and more because we're looking at entire genes where people in the past have only been looking at parts of genes, and we're looking at more genes where in the past people have been looking at a very small subset of genes. So we go through a lot of exercises at GeneDx um, evaluating those uh, unpublished, what we call novel changes. We look to see if the, the mutation has been listed in any of the disease-specific databases, and there are many. Dr. Priori's here is one I depend on greatly, by the way. Um, we look in dbSNP, which is a government-supported database of benign polymorphisms. It's not a very clean database, but it's a database. We determine whether or not we've seen this before at GeneDx, if it's in our own clinical experience, and in that case, was it the same clinical presentation as um, in the previous patient. We talk to a lot of our colleagues and our consultants. Um, many of them are here, and we appreciate your assistance whenever we have cases like this. It's just a, a great way to be able to, um, to work. We look at the actual change. So, for example, what is the nature of the change at the protein level? And we say, does this change result in a big change in, in amino acid in the size or the charge of the amino acid, for example? So here you have a cysteine to arginine change, and that big yellow ball is a sulfur ion, and you can tell there's a huge difference between what cysteine looks like and arginine looks like, and you can imagine that's going to have a, a major impact on the protein, either on its secondary structure or its ability to interact with other proteins that it interacts with. Is there a constraint on the protein that's caused by <clears throat> loss of a proline, for example? Another question we ask is, compared to the same protein in other species or other related proteins in the same family of proteins, is this position conserved throughout evolution? So we'll look from through mammals down to chicken to fish to um, zebrafish. We like zebrafish particularly. Um, all the way down to the common earthworm. And we say in this particular position, in that protein, in that critter, has this position been conserved? If it's conserved throughout evolution, we think that it probably is there for a reason. And so that gives us some um, feeling that this may be a more important change. And we also use a variety of different computer-based algorithms, modeling algorithms, to say, given this sequence, this is the protein, what happens if we change it in this position? So we have some in silico analyses as well that goes into our evaluations of novel changes when we find them. We look at the protein itself. Where does the change occur? Is it a, in a, a known functional region? Um, we like transmembrane domain mutations because we usually think that they're real, but I was just talking today about transmembrane mutations that don't cause problems or there aren't any mutations in the transmembrane of the gene, and that's quite unusual. Um, but we use our knowledge of the protein itself, and we look at the distribution of mutations that have been reported previously, uh, looking for hot spots, for example, of where mutations might have been. Um, and then we say, it, well, if maybe this change is just a rare benign polymorphism, we can check the databases to look for that, or what we do is we evaluate normal control individuals. So we can evaluate up to 400 control individuals in a run, or we can take samples one by one, and we look at, for example, 200 Caucasians. If you have a Caucasian patient, we look at 200 African Americans. We also have some other um, sub-ethnicities that we can test for and say, is this just something that's seen in the general population of supposedly healthy control individuals? And that's another level of evaluation that we do when we're uh, looking at a novel change in a patient. So what do the results mean when you send them out from the, the laboratory to the ordering physician? Well, you might get a positive result, relatively easy from my end, now all the work is on your end. You might get a negative result. Um, which also can often put a lot of work on your end. And you might get what we all hate, a variant of unknown significance. We found something, we really don't know what it means. So I'll give you a little idea of what kind of reports you might see from GeneDx, and these are actually, the slides are taken from actual patients. They're kind of wordy. But what does a positive genetic testing result mean? Well, you'll get a report that says what tests we performed and what the result is in big letters, so that's the easy part. 
It was abnormal. It was positive. And in this case, we had a patient who was tested on the HCM panel, and we found a deletion of four base pairs in the MYBPC3 gene. And we interpret this to mean that this is a disease-causing mutation, and why? And we give you the evidence, our thinking. Why do we think this mutation is a disease-causing mutation? And here we tell you it's expe expected to result in an abnormal truncated protein because the translation of the protein is stopped because this deletion of four base pairs messes up the reading frame all the way through. And then you'll get that information back to you. We'll tell you what we would recommend from a genetic standpoint. Um, who else in the family might be the, uh, the next appropriate person to be testing, and how to go about doing that testing. What does a negative result mean? You're going to get something that says negative, no disease-causing mutation was detected. We'll tell you that we, which genes we've tested, for example. We'll tell you what the expected sensitivity of that test would be. Um, and then we tell you clearly, because you know this as well, that a negative result doesn't rule out a genetic basis for the diagnosis in the patient because there are likely other genes not yet identified that haven't been tested, and there may be positions within these genes way deep in the introns that could have a change that we would not pick up. What does a boost genetic testing result mean? Well, we tell you what we found, and then we go through why we have information on both sides. We'll tell you the data suggests the variant that the particular data that suggests the variant may be disease causing is A, B, and C. And then there's information that leads us to think it may not be disease causing is A, B, and C. And therefore, we are unable to determine that this is either disease causing or not. And then we can tell you um, who else you might want to test in the family to help resolve the issue. In many cases, testing other individuals in the family will be done at no charge because we're just as interested as you are in determining whether or not this is a real mutation. So we want to see if it segregates with disease in the family. Um, and we may want to test parents. We may want to test another affected individual in the family, maybe siblings, depending on exactly what the, the change is. And then we hope that you and we will be keeping up with the literature, and if you ever see this again or we see this again, there may be more information that tells us how to interpret this variant in the future, and we can always go back and, and do things again and reinterpret a result should that be necessary. So why would you want to even consider doing genetic testing? This could take about six hours, so I'm going to say very, very briefly. The first thing you, you would want to do genetic testing in order to identify other family members who may be at risk of the disease. For example, in HCM, you might want to distinguish um, cardiomyopathy from athlete's heart. This is one way to do so. You can sometimes give a prognosis to a patient that's specific to the mutation you identify. Many families are interested in reproductive planning. This is going, there's a tremendous increase in demand for having control over these things in families. So reproductive planning will allow people to do prenatal diagnosis, should everybody be comfortable with that. Pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is very hot um, and, and very doable in families like this. You can stratify the risk of sudden death to guide your ICD placement based on the mutation results. You can tailor medical care in many cases, modify lifestyles, avoid certain known triggers, known risks, especially uh, important in long QT syndrome. You can do preventive pharmacotherapy, and you can determine whether or not to increase surveillance or decrease surveillance, depending on what the test result is. And that is really all I'm going to say, because I think the most important and interesting part of this will be the discussions we have at the table. So I thank you all for attending our session. I can speak um, openly as to some of the things that came up at our table.